All right, joining us today, we have New York Times bestselling author, sports journalist, and podcast host, Jeff Perlman. Jeff, how are you doing today, sir? I am uh, considering the world is coming to an end. I'm doing okay. <laughs> You're surviving down there south of the border? I'm trying my best. I'm trying yeah, my best. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, we're obviously, we're recording in two very different places right now. We're all the way up here in Ottawa, Canada. You're, you're out on the West Coast there, just south of LA there. You know, how are things down there? What, what, what's sort of the general feeling and sort of what, what's a day-to-day -day life like? Well, I have a, two kids in high school and they're both full-time at home because of COVID. Yeah. And they're great kids, so it's worked out okay, but it sucks for them. My daughter's a senior in high school and she's missing her senior year. And She's an athlete, her sport's not being played, and that sucks, you know? Um, Trump, every day, I feel like screaming, and it's really rough, and, you know, California's burning, and he came out here a few days ago and said, no, it'll cool, don't worry. And it's like, oh, thanks. You know, I was worried, but thanks for clearing my mind. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. It's just been a year, you know? It's been a, it's been a really brutal year here, probably for you too, but differently. Um, but I'm lucky, because I... I write books for a living and I have great kids and I have a great wife and I work from home and you take what you can get, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, speaking of that, you know, during this pandemic and this shutdown, everyone's been sort of locked in at home there. Do you feel like you've been getting more writing done or, or, or less writing done than you normally would this time of year? That's an interesting question because I usually work at coffee shops. That's my place. I love going to coffee shops and sitting. And a lot of times I'll go to coffee shops and get, not get nearly as much done as uh, I probably should. Um, being home, I'm reporting a new book. I'm working on a book about Bo Jackson, a former football baseball player. I mean, everyone's home during a pandemic. Like, everyone's home. So you call people, they generally pick up their phones. And um, you're not in a coffee shop, so you're home and you're kind of focused and you can't go anywhere. And I would say I've been pretty freaking productive. Once I got past the early, God, this is the worst thing ever state. I know, what about you? Are you more productive during COVID? Uh yeah, yes and no. Depends on the day of the week. I've got a four-year-old and a one-year-old there, so it depends uh, what, what kind of mood they're in and what, whether their naps line up what, what, the, when the sort yeah. of planets align and they're both down at the same time. I can bang out quite a bit there, but when the, uh, the one-year-old's in a mood, it's a, a whole different ball game for sure. We just lock our kids in the closet. You could try that. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no one's doing welfare checks during a pandemic, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you've been a writer now for, you know, Sports Illustrated, ESPN.com, Newsday, just to, just to sort of name a few here. And on the other side of the coin, you've also written nine full-length books as well, too. So uh, after all this, do you sort of have a preference for one over the other in terms of sort of the short-form column or the deep-dive research into a, a book, or are they about the same? Um, no, I, uh, I love writing books. I really do. I mean, it's, uh, I've used this analogy many times, but only because it works for me. Um, when I was in college, I had a girlfriend, and she had really sharp nails. And there was this one time she gave me, this, this is going to sound weird, but it's true. She gave me this really good back scratch. I was sick and she gave me a back scratch. And I looked at my back and it was all bloody because her nails are sharp. But it was the best back scratch I've ever had. That's basically what writing a book is. Like, it's the ultimate in pleasure pain. It is a nightmare where you think everything sucks and it's never going to be good. and Nobody's talking to me. And why won't they pick up the phone? And this sucks. And God, my health anxiety is kicking up. And I'm just... I'm miserable and I can't stare at the screen another minute, right? So there's a lot of that. But there's also a lot of, holy crap, I just got that guy on the phone for four hours. And oh my God, look at this nugget I found. And it's a beautiful day and I'm sitting on my porch while my friends are working at the bank, you know, like, and I'm not wearing shoes. And it's awesome. And I get to dive into these subjects that I actually am interested in. So I think what I've come to learn over time um, through books is... There's no such thing as true pleasure without a little bit of pain. Like if you, if it comes too easy, there was no work to it. What's the payoff, you know? And like this book I'm promoting now, I'm not trying to switch, but like it was a pain in the ass. It was hard. It was really hard. It was, it was oftentimes miserable, but I feel like that makes the payoff more rewarding as you suffer through this misery and you make it and you feel good about it. So there's that thing about books that I actually love, even though it sounds like I hate it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Didn't, didn't know where you were going with that story with the yeah. back scratch claw marks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, but yeah. It, it all came full circle in the end, eh? Uh, so, I, I mean, you're, you're like, what is this guy talking about? Wait, yeah. what? Wait, wait. <laughs> is this about to get X rated? Because I really, you know, I have two kids. 
Yeah, yeah, we'll have to put the Not Safe for Work uh, logo up on this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, I mean, you're pretty well known in the industry just for the sheer volume of interviews that you do in, in leading up to a book. You know, I, I read somewhere that you did 500 plus for the Brett Favre book. You did close to 700 for your Walter Payton book there. Yeah. So, so for your newest book here, if you had to ballpark it, how, how many did you think you did for this latest one? Probably 350, which sounds lower than the others, but... Um... Basketball rosters are so much smaller. Mm -hmm. Like you do an NFL book, you, there's a gazillion people. Even do a baseball book, there are a gazillion people. NBA rosters are fairly small. So it's a little bit, you know, you're a little bit more limited. Probably about 350, 300, 350. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, when we we're talking still, that, that, that sheer volume there of hundreds and hundreds of people there, uh, we're obviously getting larger than just the, the, the close family and friends circle here, right? So, oh, yeah. you, you know, in your experience, who's had sort of some of the best stories that you wouldn't necessarily expect to come from? You know, is it the equipment managers? Is it the old oh, high yes. school coaches? Who's got the best dirt there? All right. So like uh, my first book was about the 1986 New York Mets and the, uh, the bat boys were awesome. Just <laughs> awesome. And the equipment guys were awesome. They were just awesome. And um, I learned when I was at sports illustrated from kind of watching Tom Verducci, who was kind of the king of it all. Um, when everyone else goes to Jeter, go to the middle reliever or go to the backup catcher or go to the pitching coach, you know, talk to those people who aren't talked to. So like even this book, like a lot of the best stuff, especially about Kobe in particular, were guys who were playing on the summer league teams with Kobe in 96 and 97. Like mm -hmm. you wouldn't remember them, David Booth and Jimmy King and Isaiah Fontaine, you know, whatever, you know, like guys you wouldn't think of, but guys who have these very vivid in fact, even guys he played against in the summer league. There are a lot of guys on the, like the Suns team who were awesome. And they, my general philosophy is like, I kind of developed this with Favre a little bit. Like uh, Brett Favre isn't going to remember probably the free agent halfback from Bucknell who's in camp with the Packers for three weeks in 1999. But the kid from Bucknell is going to remember everything about Brett Favre. He's yeah. going to remember that time he helped him tie a shoe and the joke he told and Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So finding those guys is far more important than you might think on the surface. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know your, your newest book here is coming out shortly. Uh, you know, Three Ring Circus, Kobe and Shaq and Phil, and the crazy years of the Lakers dynasty. This is actually your second book now uh, on the Lakers. Here, did did you have any you know sort of nostalgic moments or familiar little flashbacks when you were writing this of like, oh yeah, th th this is kind of similar to the, the first one, or any sources that you tapped into a second time? Yeah, well, one of my favorite people is uh, Jeannie Buss, who's the owner of the Lakers. I just really enjoy her. And um, she was great. I first met her working on Showtime. And when I knew she was different is uh, I went to interview her. I'd never met her before. She's like, all right, let's just meet for lunch. And she shows up, her and her good friend and colleague, Linda Rambis, just, they show up at this restaurant and we sit down for three hours and we talk. And she, um, again, for this book, you know, Jeannie, I'm doing this book, blah, blah, blah. All right, why don't you come by the offices and we'll just sit down and talk. She connected me with Phil Jackson. You know, she actually said, I'll, I'll hook you up with Phil, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she's just great. Like, she's just really great. So it's always nice to be dealing with her. Um, and there was some crossover. Like, Kurt Rambis was a player in the 80s. He was a coach during this era. So I love Kurt Rambis. He's a great guy. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely some crossover between the yeah. two. Yeah. In, in terms of how the, the two teams themselves functioned there, once you started, you know, sifting through all the stories there, did, did you see any similarities in terms of, you know, how they either function behind the scenes or, or how they were run between the Showtime Lakers and, and the Kobe and Shaq era there? Well, I mean, if you look at sort of this era when they were really rolling, it was Phil Jackson was a coach. And I think there are a lot of some pretty good similarities between Phil Jackson and Pat Riley as mm -hmm. far as, I mean, when Phil Jackson comes to the Lakers, um, he's just really respected. He's won six rings with Chicago. He played. He won two rings with the Knicks as a player. He coached Michael Jordan. He's just really respected. And, and it was an era where coaches were starting to lose their power in the NBA. It was like the start of that era where players had more power than coaches. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Pat Riley, same thing. Like He kind of earned it with the Lakers, but he was another coach who really became this presence. And it's rare nowadays that you have coach-centric organizations. It just doesn't happen that much anymore. Frank Vogel, if Le LeBron James doesn't want Vogel as a coach, he's gone tomorrow. You know, yeah. these two guys were powerful coaches who had plenty of say. Um, 
that was the thing. It's funny. Like Shaquille O'Neal basically was Magic Johnson in a lot of ways. The charisma and the smile and the sort of gravitated to the spotlight. And in some ways, Kareem was Kobe Bryant. Um, a little more reluctant, a little more guarded. Uh, great player, but, you know, kind of had his issues and a little guarded. So there are definitely some crossovers. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, you know, everyone and anyone who's a sports fan has heard of and is probably pretty well versed in the Kobe and Shaq feud there. But really, you know, the, the stuff that made the headlines is probably only the tip of the iceberg as far as what was really going on between them on a day to day basis. Uh, after going through, you know, all the material you had for the book, did you get the sense that it was just, you know, a 24 seven thing where they were just constantly at each other's throats or what did it seem more like that there were periods of coexistence marked by th these big blow ups every now and then? Yeah, it definitely wasn't 24 seven. I mean, they were never buddy, buddy. Um, I wouldn't even say it was hatred. It was dislike, you know, uh, maybe there was some hatred on Kobe's part, but generally it was, it was more dislike and uh, you know, Kobe, they're just so different. Like Kobe was a, you need to be in the gym all the time guy. That's his legacy. It's a really powerful legacy. His work ethic is his legacy and it's super powerful. And Shaq was, look, I busted my ass all season. Now I want to eat a cheeseburger and I want to float in a pool and I want to smoke a cigar and I want to hang with my boys and I want to enjoy life. And I think that, I think people mistook that for, um, for being lazy or for not being professional. And I think that's a huge mistake. I think that's what you should do. Like, you're only going to be 27 playing in the NBA, super rich with women all over you once in your life. That doesn't last forever. You know, like it really doesn't last forever. And I think Co Shaq really appreciated that the moment was here and I'm going to embrace it as much as I can. But it drove Kobe Bryant crazy because he saw this guy who he thought could have been even better who can hit a freaking free, free throw when it counted. And that really bothered him. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say that maybe one was more so the, the aggressor in, in that relationship than the other? Or do you think they, they equally sort of shared the blame in terms of how it could have worked out better in the end there? You know, they were both annoyingly passive aggressive. It's super <laughs> weird. They, um, they shared a locker room. They weren't that far apart. And heaven forbid they actually say something to the other guy's face. You know, they had a couple of fights and all that stuff. But like, mainly it was media member comes over here, talks to Shaq. Oh, Shaq said something about Kobe. Now we're going to go to Kobe and we'll get Kobe's take. And then Kobe will say something. We better go back to Shaq and say it. So it was so babyish and so juvenile in a lot of ways and kind of pathetic. And I think in that regard, that's kind of reflects more poorly on Shaq because he's the older guy and he was a veteran. And he wanted to be a leader. You know, there just was not that much directness to it all. It was much more taking shots with the press, which is really worsey, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's stories where, you know, Phil Jackson, when Kobe first arrived, tried to get Shaq to sort of mentor him a little bit. And that, that sort of obviously didn't didn't work out as planned there. What, what kind of a role did, did Phil play in all of this other than Peacemaker when they would take their little barbs at each other in the media there? Um, it's kind of interesting. He. Uh, I think he was very smart in that. In the way, same way he was with Dennis Rodman with the balls. He wasn't going to be the guy who storms in the locker room all the time and says, you guys need to work this out. You guys need to he kind of let it work itself out. And he would get a lot of conduits also. Um, Brian Shaw, Rick Fox, you know, uh, John Sally for a while. Just different guys who he would use and who he expected to be kind of leaders. Um, There's actually a nonstop conga line of people brought into the balls during that era to take Kobe under their wing and try to help, help Kobe. And it never worked. Kobe just didn't want to hear it. You know, he was stubborn and he knew he had the way and he didn't want to hear it. Um, and I, you know, Phil was clearly a Shaq guy. He wanted the offense to run through Shaq and he considered Shaq the most, and he didn't, he got really tired of coaching Kobe after a while. It just started to beat him down a little bit. But I do think the main thing he did was kind of stay hands off and not be a babysitter and allow these things to play out. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, things sort of famously really fell off a cliff after the, the, the Denver incidents and, um, you know, everything that sort of went on around there. If we hopped in a time machine today and we go back in time, those never come to light. Those never happen. You know, do, do you think that the Lakers could have squeezed another couple years out of the, the Kobe Shaq sort of era? Or do you think even by that time, their partnership had kind of run its course? I think... Um... 
it's interesting. We ask that all the time of dynasties. Like that's a question I've gotten a lot because I've written a lot of different dynastic teams. They asked me about the 86 Mets and it's like, could they have won more World Series? And I always say they could have won more World Series if Strawberry and Gooden weren't Coke addicts. You know, could the, could the Dallas Cowboys have won more Super Bowls? I guess so if half those of that team wasn't, you know, like uh, Michael Irvin, like just insane and like out of their minds. Yeah, of course they could have. You know, like it's always that question. I just think like, could the Lakers have won more? Yeah, if Kobe were more mature, if Shaq was willing to put in more work, if Phil could still tolerate Kobe, um, it just wasn't like Kobe was done. He was done with it. There was no, there was nothing you could say that would make him want to play with Shaq anymore. Uh, There's a moment, uh, Kareem Rush told me this. There was a moment after the, uh, they lose to the Pistons in game five, the NBA finals are over. They're having a little team party in Detroit or outside of Detroit. And Kobe walks up to Kareem Rush and is like, I'm not playing with that motherfucker ever again. Hmm. And like, he wasn't. Like, that was it. He was fed up. He was either leaving for the Clippers or the Lakers are going to make changes. And if they had kept Shaq, Kobe Bryant is a, is a member of the Clippers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you think this Lakers dynasty, if we fast forward a, a couple decades from now, is going to be remembered in terms of its legacy versus maybe the Showtime Lakers? This is not a sexy answer. I'm not sure how well it is remembered. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what people remember more is this stretch of Kobe Bryant where he won five rings and this stretch of Shaq where he won four rings and that there are these two larger, like one problem with reporting this book or not a problem, but one of the things I ran into a lot was you can't escape the Shaq Kobe narrative, no matter how hard you try. And I, when I write these books, I'm as interested in Mark Madsen and Kareem Rush and Derek Fisher, like those guys as much. But you talk to them, and it always comes back to Shaq Kobe, inevitably, because it was such a just bizarre and strange and unique situation. So I think I don't think people are going to be like, ah, oh, the Laker dynasty of blah, blah, blah. I think they're going to be more like, remember Kobe Bryant? Remember Shaquille O'Neal? Remember that run? That was a pretty crazy run. But I think it's going to be more about those players than it is about the dynasty, if that makes sense. Like, I think people remember the 80s Celtics as this dynasty. I think they remember the 80s Lakers as this dynasty. I think they're I, the Bulls certainly are the Jordan dynasty. I think they're going to think of the Lakers more for the two players and what they meant in a grand scale to the NBA. Yeah, so they're almost going to be remembered more for the headlines they made and and the potential that they, you know, maybe blew up and then before Shaq went off to Miami than they are actually their on court performance then maybe. Probably, but I also think who cares? Like, why is that? You know, like we talk so much about this. Like, who cares? Like, what difference does it make? What does that even mean? You know, like. One day the world's going to blow up and none of this is going to exist anyway. Like what difference does it make what people were saying 40 years ago about about? I mean, are you and I, how often are we talking about Bob Cousy? Never. It's, nobody cares anymore. Like it's just, we move on. So, you know, you'll remember Shaq. You'll tell your kids, oh, I remember this time I saw Shaq and it was great. And then people move on and it happens, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't mean to be so glum. I just, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, it is. Yeah, no, it is. It is, right? And, you know, obviously Kobe's tragic death in January there was a surprise to everyone. At what point were you in your book? Had you already submitted? Was it still ongoing at that point? Where were you in the process when that news kind of broke? I was done. It was in. It was edited. It was done. Uh, I got the news. I was sitting in a coffee shop working, and a friend of mine named Amy Bass texted me the news. Couldn't believe it. Just couldn't believe it. It felt like uh, when I was a kid and the Challenger exploded. We were just like, wait, that doesn't, that didn't just happen. It just didn't make sense. And then I just saw it like, I really felt compelled to write. They let me write basically an author's note at the beginning, a three page author's note. And I did it for two reasons. Basically, number one, what you're about to read is not the most flattering portrait always of Kobe Bryant, but it's only a portion of his life and you need to remember that. It's not the entirety, it's who he was. And I did that, number one, because I sincerely believe it. And number two, I did it because I don't want people thinking I like, am trying to capitalize on Kobe Bryant's death by sneaking around. And try, I mean, I reported this, all of this before he died. And it's yeah. just, it's an uncomfortable thing to promote a book after someone has passed away. Yeah, yeah. 
and you know obviously with his passing there, there's been all sorts of stuff that, that is sort of you know taken a, a front seat not only with his work with his daughter's team but just advancing women's basketball but yeah. obviously a huge part has been his sort of mamba mentality and what went into that and all of that good stuff as well too do you think that you know, during his younger years, when he was having all these clashes with Shaq, you know, what, was it a case of, you know, that Mamba mentality clashing with the, like you said, sort of the more laid back, goofy personality of Shaq? Or do you think that that whole Mamba personality only really came out after Shaq left and he sort of had the show to himself and that's when he really developed that? So when I interviewed Shaq in Atlanta, I had an exchange about this with him that it kind of stood out to me. I, um, I said to him, I was like, uh, it's interesting. I said this to Shaq. It's interesting how you had all these nicknames, you know, Shaq Diesel and the big Aristotle and Superman. I, was, I said, but you always seem to be joking about it. Like it was always done with a wink. You know, it was never serious. It was never really serious. Yeah. And I was like, but Kobe thought of himself as the Black Mamba. Like it wasn't a joke. It wasn't like he was in on the joke. He gave himself a nickname and he thought of himself as that nickname. And Shaq said to me, uh, and again, this is before Kobe died. He said, uh, now you know what I was dealing with, man. And like, <laughs> I think that kind of says it pretty well. Like Shaq was in on the joke. It was a joke, like a glorious joke, but he was making foolish amounts of money to basically wear pajamas and throw a ball in a metal cylinder. And it was funny and it was great and it was amazing. And to Kobe, there was nothing funny about that. It was, this is my job and you got to kill or you're going to be killed and you got to go all out and this is it. And I just think uh, it was two just opposite approaches to the same profession. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, obviously not only his words at you know Kobe's funeral, but just even in some of his interviews he's done since, was there anything that maybe surprised you about their relationship that he, he came out and said after, you know, Kobe's passing there? Or do you think that, you know, in, in, since they both retired, they, they, they seem to have both mellowed out quite a bit there and they were starting to build those, those bridges back together there. Do, do you, do you, did anything catch you by surprise that he, he said or mentioned? Well, I actually thought uh, the amount of emotion that overcame Shaq when Kobe died mm -hmm. was really powerful and really, I don't know if surprising is the right word, but you know, like they didn't like each other, at least not when they were playing and they weren't, it's not like they were buddy, buddy talking on the phone all the time when they stopped playing. Like they were, Kobe was difficult and Shaq could be ornery and they were not best friends. And I just thought it was really kind of beautiful. Um, how what, what Shaq saw more than anything was this guy, the passing of a guy who he's, he's gone through life with and a guy who he really had this kinship with, maybe not on the court, maybe not as teammates, but they were always going to be tied together. It's always going to be Shaq and Kobe, the same way it's going to be Dwight Gooden and Darryl Strawberry, the same way it's going to be Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers or Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris. Like, it's always going to be Shaq and Kobe, Kobe and Shaq. It's inescapable. I think that really hit Shaq in a genuinely profound and beautiful way. And that caught me off guard. I didn't see that coming. Yeah. Yeah. Now, w would it be safe to assume that you, like most of the sports world, uh, were watching The Last Dance documentary as it was coming out on Netflix? Yeah. There? Loved it. Thought it was great. Yeah. So, so given the fact that, you know, both were Phil Jackson coach teams, both were three-peats, um, and, and, you know, Kobe spent the better part of his life trying to emulate Jordan there, did, did you – see any similarities between how you know that that coach player relationship was between you know phil jackson and michael jordan and phil jackson and kobe were, were, were they similar at all or, or were they pretty polar opposite in terms of his approach to them well i can only speak to when phil was coaching him through 04 not the second run with gasol okay and lamar odom mm -hmm. um i think he viewed michael jordan um as a partner more as a partner like we're doing this together. And I think he viewed Kobe Bryant more as an adolescent. He sort of had to uh, prod and remind and sometimes belittle. And I think Shaq had more, Shaq had a little more of the Jordan role as far as a guy who, you know, um, he could sort of confide in and they could confide in. So I think it was actually drastically different uh, relationship like drastically different relationship Kobe wanted to be Jordan mm -hmm. Kobe came as close to being Jordan as anyone could be but you know Jordan was a more mature more polished 
human being than Kobe. So mm -hmm. he could have a different relationship with him in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now that it's submitted, it's coming out very shortly. What, what was your biggest takeaway from this book now that you're looking back on it? I mean, that's interesting. As a writer, it was probably the hardest book I've ever had to write mm -hmm. because modern athletes are different than older athletes. They really are. And it's not saying I usually say, but it's true. They're just more difficult and they're more entitled and they have, you know, they've been kind of coddled um, more than the older athletes have. And they're just more difficult to pin down and to get and to, it, this was a lot of work. There's a lot of very exhausting was breaking out every tool I've got for this book, you know. So that was as a, as a journalist. I would say as a, just as a basketball sort of entity and all, um, I think the thing that's interesting that struck me about it is this idea that Shaq and Kobe, like, this idea that, like, you know what, they didn't get along on the court, but, man, they blended beautifully on the court. I don't actually buy it. I just think they were both great. Like, I think they were both great players. At the same time, I don't think they blended beautifully on the court. They, it worked well because it was so good. But Kobe didn't like passing down low, and Shaq didn't like seeing Kobe Bryant dribble all the, all, the, all the time. But it goes to show you that sometimes, like, just having a great coach and talent is more important than your players being, you know, having, you know, like Stockton and Malone. You don't always need Stockton and Malone. They were not Stockton and Malone. Stockton and Malone were, had this symbiotic relationship. Kobe and Shaq did not. They were two great players with a great coach and it worked out because they were super, super talented. I just think that's interesting. A lot of people always think, oh, they really put their set aside their egos and on the court. No, they were just great. They're yeah. just freaking great. And they were better than you. That's how they won. Yeah. You know? So this is one of those cases where just sheer talent on the floor ended up beating out chemistry. Yeah. Ta well, and also like they were Jerry West constructed this team. And I guess Mitch Kupchak to a lesser degree, it was a beautifully constructed team, you know, like, pieces fit really well the rick foxes and the robert ories and the brian shaws and the mark madsons and the tyron Lou and the Derek fisher like they basically had these building blocks and they slid in these pieces that fit in really well so it was definitely a part of it was the building of a really finely uh, oiled machine but a lot of it also was just having these two behemoths you know i mean shaq and kobe are two of the you can make a very strong argument they're two of the 10 best basketball players to ever play Mm -hmm. At the worst, they're two of the tw 20 best at the same time. Yeah. Crazy, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned it off the top that you're already working on a, another book right now, but, you know, how much downtime did you afford yourself once you finally submitted this one until you started doing the research for your next one there? None, really. I mean, maybe a day or two, but then you start thinking, what am I going to do next? What can I do next? How am I going to do it? It's uh you know, the bills don't pay themselves, you know, and, and you just writing, you know, I, you're self-employed when you're a writer and, and you're an author and you just, you just got to keep it churning. Plus I love what I do. So it's not, it doesn't really feel like work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Has it, has it been harder or easier to uh, get people on, whether it's a phone call or zoom call or whatever for an interview uh, since the pandemics happened there? Um, easier, but writing a book or, and definitely promoting a book during a pandemic sucks. Mm -hmm. it's uh, promoting it is really much harder and the whole like the whole thing about writing a book and then promoting it is it's like like there's a great writer named lee montville who once said to me you basically spend two years in a hole and you come out and enjoy the light for two weeks but part of that light is you know oh we're gonna get you up to the studio and we're gonna do this and you're gonna do that and you're gonna do this and you're gonna appear at your hometown bookstore and it's gonna be great that doesn't really exist it's a little bit of a, i mean i can't complain compared to what most people are going through it's a little bit of a disappointment though yeah yeah so i mean uh, uh, as a canadian i've got to ask this here now so you, you've covered all the major sports leagues you've even written a book on the usfl the, the one There's thing no was, hockey book coming yeah the, the, i was gonna say when, when's the, the the great jeff perlman hockey novel coming out? i'll put it to you this way i can probably name three nba players right now i'm at nhl players right now um <laughs> i was a big islanders fan as a kid growing up in new york with the mike bossy and brian trotty and billy smith and all that but um I don't know. It might, you might have to do that one for me. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't hold my breath then, eh? Yeah. You do not hold your breath. <laughs>
Uh, are you watching the Islanders in, in their uh, cup run this year at all, or not even on the radio? I watch highlights. It's just why we don't watch sports in this house very often. You'd be shocked. Yeah. We, uh, TV's not usually on at all. Yeah. All right. Well, b- before I let you go here, you know, I have to ask. So given all the research you've done, both on Showtime Lakers, the, the Kobe and Shaq era there, gun to your head and assuming that they don't bite each other's heads off while they're out there. In a 2v2 game, who are you taking? Are you taking Magic and Kareem or Kobe and Shaq? I, if I took those 80s Lakers versus the Shaq Kobe Lakers, I take the 80s Lakers. But in a two on two game, I mean, Kobe is lighting up Magic. You know, Magic's just too slow. He's not guarding Kobe well. And Shaq is beating the living crap out of Kareem. I mean, Kareem could flick off some sky hooks and on. But no, I, I actually think that's kind of a mismatch. I think Kobe and Shaq just absolutely decimate them. But I think those Lakers with Worthy, with Rambis, with Michael Cooper, all those guys, I think they win a series against the. Shaq Kobe Lakers. There you go. Best of both worlds there. Yeah. So uh, where can people find you and where, where can people get your book when it comes out there? Where, where can people, you know, get more information about it? Well, I'm on Twitter way too often at Jeff, uh, at Jeff Perlman, uh, website, Jeff And the book is available everywhere. You know, it's coming out in a few days. So it is, you order it, it's coming. It's available, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. But I, I haven't found a bookseller yet that doesn't have it. So your odds are pretty good. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us and uh, stay safe. And uh, we'll, we'll love to connect with you again in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it.